invasive and they're damaging. And that's the big difference about why we're trying to mitigate these problems. Um, so how did they get here? They were brought over on ships. Um, DeSoto and, and other explorers were the first in the 1500s to bring pigs over on ships, and these were domestic pigs. Of course, they are native to areas in Europe. And so uh, these were food sources for, for future <coughs> explorations when they came back to what is now North America, the United States. And so they set these animals free um, intentionally, but not understanding what the ramifications would be of setting uh, such a hardy animal loose in areas such as Florida. And you can see that this purple line kind of uh, tracks DeSoto's exploration trail. Uh, they were first brought into areas which are now Florida and set free. And of course, Florida still has uh, a pretty huge population of feral hogs in their state. Anybody here from Florida? Okay, great. You probably are well aware. <coughs> What is a wild hog is a question that I get quite a bit. What constitutes a, a wild hog versus a Russian boar versus you know, a domestic pig? Uh, and really in the old world where both Russian uh, wild boar and domestic swine are native, you know, they, we would get escapees. And of course the Russian boar are, are wild anyways, but the domestic swine uh, would, get, would maybe escape or become feralized um, and they would be left on their own uh, with no controls or fencing. And so the wild hogs would continue to breed in, in that manner in the old world. In North America, we've got a combination of how feral swine um, are developed, really. We've got the Eurasian wild boar. We actually do still have a small uh, pocket of population of uh, wild boar. But then we also have escapees of domestic pigs. And those animals will interbreed the boar and the pig. And so and that is one way to get a wild hog. Um, we also have animals, uh, domestic swine, that will escape from their enclosures and become feralized. And believe it or not, it only takes about two generations to, be, to get a feral hog from a domestic swine. The hair, the coat starts to grow almost immediately to adapt to uh, climates, and also the tusks for the rooting purposes. Um, and also for fighting. The, the boars grow their tusks, tusks quite rapidly. In the southeast, this is where we find most of our pockets of feral swine. And so, unfortunately, I want to say unfortunately, people didn't know better, they're a great animal to hunt if you have never hunted a, a wild hog. Um, my son enjoys it immensely if he's sitting in a tree stand and gets a hog instead of a deer. Um, it's a successful hunting day. but. They were brought in and deliberately released in areas of the southeast. Um, a lot of them escaped. Uh, some of them were kept in preserves. A lot of them escaped. And then they hybridized with either domestic swine that are on the farm or with domestic swine that possibly also escaped. And hence, the populations started to increase. Now, we had some secondary introductions. Uh, in the southeast, and then we had one all the way in California, which is, uh, some people don't know why we have this big gap of, of population between uh, Louisiana all the way to uh, some areas in the west. Unfortunately, New Mexico and some of those other states are in the west are reporting wild pig populations, established populations, um, but California has had them for 100 years or more. Um, really, there was not a lot of documentation about the spread of populations of feral swine in the United States until about the 1980s when damage started to occur and people really started to take notice that these pigs were damaging uh, crops and they were doing uh, a lot of damage to property. And uh, so the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study in uh, Georgia started to take note and record where these populations were being found. And of course, you can see in the red there that most of it was concentrated in Florida, Texas, with a small population in uh, California. And then uh, as hunting these wild pigs started to become more popular, in 2009, uh, another study was done to show the spread. And I'm going to overlay the 1988 uh, population so you can see exactly what I'm talking about with this expansion. So the area gray was that original 1988, 2009. So you can see they are expanding quite rapidly and not all by natural causes, of course. Uh, they, the 
SQUIDIS is the <coughs> acronym for that study group. They have a mapping system along with USDA Wildlife Services. Um, and so there's a lot of mapping that goes on with the hog sightings. Uh, biologists will map it, landowners. And um, it, we're also seeing a lot of disease spread with the population expansion. There was a pretty steady reporting of, of feral swine in states uh, from the 1900s to about 1988 when the squid has started uh, documenting the populations. Of course, you can see that there is a huge increase between 1990 and 2000. And that is when really the hunting of feral swine became very popularized. Um, and so we saw populations just explode. A very conservative estimate for the national population size for feral swine is about 5.6 million, uh, but we like to say anywhere between about four and nine million. Texas alone has several million just in that state. So it's a very conservative number, but they continue to grow. And almost half of the counties in the United States are reporting uh, hogs. They are the second most harvest, harvested big game, and I put that in quotes because a lot of states do not recognize them as game species. Um, but just in, like in Louisiana alone, there were more hogs that were um, harvested than deer. Um, and this was from just a couple of years ago. And we're also seeing that trend in Mississippi where we're almost doubling the amount of hogs harvested over the years uh, from 2000 to 2011. Uh, and that trend continues to grow. I'm going to concentrate on Mississippi because it's where I live and mostly where I study hogs. Uh, so in 1988, we just had a few pockets of, of feral swine. Um, some of them were actually uh, <coughs> intentionally introduced into the state uh, and then that was only done once, um, and then it, people realized that that was not a good idea. Um, in 1988, only about less than 4% of Mississippi was covered in hogs. In 2009, we're looking at about 40%. And of course, now we're going on about almost 10 years later, and we're looking at about 47% of um, Mississippi covered with feral swine. And um, just about one in every county Chris, is that true? One in every county, at least? Yep. Okay. Chris Gotham is the state director for USDA Wildlife Services, and she is heavily involved with the wild hog. On the likelihood of hog invasion in Mississippi without control, and there's between a 50 and 100% likelihood of wild hog invasion across the entire state, and you can see in red that is uh, between 75 and 100% likelihood. And that is not, that's not just Mississippi. Um, it's just about every state that has hogs and um, is not controlling hogs. We did a study of landowners looking to see if they had hog presence and everywhere that you see red, a little red tab, is where hogs are present on somebody's land and they are doing damage. Uh, the little green tabs are where hogs are present but no damage has been detected yet. Um, and so you can see most of the state, these are the landowners that are reporting it, not just biologists. These are people who are actually living there and seeing hogs. Um, so we do have a widespread issue with, with hogs in Mississippi. Most of them concentrated in the delta on the coast, as you can see. Now, why are they so successful? Um, sorry. I'm going to cover some of what they eat, where they live, and how quickly they breed. And if you love the hogs, you know how quickly they breed. Um, and what might kill them or might not. They're considered an opportunistic omnivore, so they will eat just about anything. Um, most of their diet consists of vegetation, which is why we see so much crop damage from hogs. Um, they also eat meat, and so they will eat things like reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, um, even uh, small deer. So they really can survive on just about anything. <coughs> They also have a diet overlap with native wildlife. So for instance, in the fall, almost 50% of their diet overlaps with, with white-tailed deer. And that's a problem. Uh, we, we talk to hunters all over the state of Mississippi, and they are noticing that there has been a decrease in the number of white-tailed deer that they're harvesting, and possibly due to that, that diet overlap with wild hogs. Um, in the winter, spring, and summer, there's about, 
quarter of their diet that overlaps with uh, white-tailed deer. And we're talking things like acorn mass that, wa that white-tailed deer desperately need to survive through the winter. Um, sometimes they'll even eat those fawns. Um, there's been documentation of depredation of fawns. There was a, a sensationalized picture from Louisiana not too long ago that showed a wild hog carrying off a deer. Um, I don't know how true that was, but it is true that they will eat deer. <coughs> they also have wildlife impacts on things like sea turtles and ground nesting birds like turkey and quail, um, alligators, small mammals, other herptofauna. I'll show you a picture of some of the stomach contents that we've found uh, containing uh, some of those wildlife species in just a minute. But basically, they eat between 3 and 5 percent of their body weight per day. And so if you're a landowner, if you have just 100 pigs on your land, which is actually a pretty small amount, a small sounder, you're looking at 70 tons of food per year that these pigs need. That's a lot of vegetation, especially if you are an agricultural producer. You're losing a lot of your yield to these wildlife species. Um, also, pigs can live just about anywhere. Of course, they like the forested habitat, but they can, they can survive in the snow. They can survive in the desert. Um, they're very adaptable animals. And so it doesn't matter what the landscape is. They will adapt accordingly, and they will find food on whatever landscape they invade. Uh, they also breed very rapidly, and they are very prolific. Where we might have one or two fawns per doe. Uh, we're looking at up to 9, 13. Uh, in some cases, I know in the 20, uh, fetuses have been reported from sows. And so that is a problem. In addition, there's a domestication influence from those that are hybridized or feralized. So they were actually bred to have a lot of piglets. Um, the sows can become sexually mature before they're a year old. Um, they can have up to two litters per year, and they have a pretty high survival rate, so maybe half of their piglets can survive. Um, in addition, they will exponentially grow, so their populations will double each year, if not controlled. I was talking to somebody in the elevator on the, the way up this morning, talking about taking pigs off of their land, and they said, oh, we got, a, we got the whole sounder except for two. I thought, ugh, if you even leave two pigs, and, what, and they're breeding pigs, um, you, your problem will just start all over again. So that's interesting to note, especially since the boars can be also sexually mature uh, before they're a year old. They can breed year-round. There's really no breeding season for them. And they travel far and wide to find sows to breed with. They don't have a lot of natural predators. So their mortality from that is very low. They're mostly going to die from um, hunting. Um, they also seem very resilient in terms of disease. There's not a lot of things that will kill them. And so it's difficult to control them in that manner, um, dying from natural causes of things like disease. Uh, when you talk about how many do we need to control, you have to really take out over 70% of the population of where they are in order to make any difference whatsoever to even keep those populations steady. <coughs> You really should be taking out 80, 100% would be ideal, of course, to actually remove all of the pigs from that land. Um, like I said, they will move far and wide. They don't stay on one property. We've been uh, putting GPS collars on these pigs to see how far the damage occurs. This is a graduate student, Clay Gibson from Mississippi State University. He's been working on a study uh, looking at how far they will move and how far the damage occurs, and, and mostly in Sunflower County. Um, so, so you can see this radius of where they will move. You're looking at miles of movement from one boar or one sow. And a lot of it has to do with the crop rotations and uh, the drought has actually affected pig movements as well. Um, their movement patterns are very sporadic. So this yellow line shows a pig uh, navigating one landscape. Oops, I'm sorry. The blue line is the, actually the same pig as well as the red line. They're just moving in different sequences throughout the year. Um, so when we can understand these movements, that's when we can try to help control these animals. Um, I just wanted to show you some other uh, radio collar data. These yellow lines show a movement of one boar. 
And that yellow line that goes vertical is about nine miles. And so you can see how much that pig moved. And this is just it, between a couple days. This is another boar moving. Um, a lot of movement that we see. So that's just a lot of damage on multiple landowners' properties. A lot of people say, why do we care? Why don't we just go out and shoot them? Well, as we've seen, hunting alone cannot solve the problem. Um, they have a lot of negative impacts. Uh, we just finished a study with the Land Water Timber Board of Mississippi uh, looking at the amount of agricultural damage that's occurring in the Delta mostly, but we did go statewide with this study, um, looking at about $67 million per year to agricultural producers. And this was just crops. We also assessed timber and other um, recreational type things like golf courses. But uh, just looking at agricultural crops, about 67 million. This is consistent with a lot of other states and they're showing damage, Georgia, Louisiana, some of those that have reported uh, wild pig damage to crops. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the damage was repair damage. It wasn't even the actual loss to crops. That only constituted about 10%. It was the control mechanisms and the repair damage and constantly going out. There was also injuries reported from people who uh, were on tractors and other equipment who uh, that equipment was damaged and they had actual personal injury from being on that equipment while they went, went into different wallows and ruts from the pigs. They love peanuts. That's probably their go-to. It's high energy, high fat. Um, and it's easy to dig up because it grows on the ground. Uh, corn is another very commonly damaged crop from pigs. Uh, in Mississippi, we're finding between 10 and 15% of cornfields are damaged by hogs. And just, here's some pictures of some other damage. You can actually see the, the rooting. It looks like a machine went through and rooted up the corn, but these are actually pigs that have gone through and taken the corn. And here's a close-up picture of that. Just walked along the rows of, of seeds and, and took them right out of the ground, right after planting. And so we're seeing right after planting, and of course as the, as the crops come out and mature, is another time when the pigs are really hitting hard on these uh, agricultural producers. Here's some aerial slides showing that they really like the, the buffer zone, they like that, that edge. Um, they don't necessarily damage the entire field. However, we're finding that there's uh, damage done to irrigation pipes, and there's wallows being created in these uh, middle of these fields as well. In the summer when they like cover, they will go into the middle of the fields. Uh, rice is being damaged. Here's another picture of aerial damage on the edges. Um, hay fields, orchards, most crops will be affected. Uh, we are doing a, a hog diet study that is showing a lot of crops, a lot of vegetation in the stomachs. Um, they also conflict with livestock, eat their food, as well as spread diseases to livestock. Um, they've been found in you know, hay areas, in water troughs, um, grain bins. The hogs um, are having a lot of overlap with livestock, and this is really putting the livestock at risk for disease. Um, just general contact with livestock is dangerous to these animals. Um, and of course, if they are getting into swineries, there's the potential for interbreeding. Uh, Pseudorabies and swine brucellosis has been found uh, pretty commonly in Mississippi. And then I was talking about um, the herptofauna that they've been eating. We've got mussel shells right there, uh, frog. This is a whole armadillo that was found in a pig's stomach. And that's a turtle egg shell. It looks like my turn is up, but I just have a couple more things. <laughs> um, this is damaged in Octavia County. Uh, we are also seeing national monuments being damaged, uh, the Vicksburg National Military Park. Uh, we're seeing highways, along highways. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of huge increase in um, pig vehicle collisions, and they do a lot more damage than deer because they do not have that membrane on their eyes that's reflective, and they also have a very low center of gravity, so they do a lot of vehicle damage. Um, in a study in France, and we're still looking at uh, the United States, a study in France is showing over 20,000 car collisions in 2009 alone. Um, they're also damaging levees, which is a huge issue, especially when there's flooding occurring. Um, and people's, just people's property. This is a front yard. This is a backyard. This is around a tennis court. This is a golf course. So you can see a lot of damage being done. This is Bronson's slide, and he likes to say, when pigs fly, 
Um, and of course, they can't fly, but they can ride and be transported. And so that's where we're seeing a lot of the problem of the population increase. Um, remember we talked about the states reporting wild pigs really jumping from 1990 to 2000. Well, we believe that's when a lot of the transportation efforts started happening and people were putting pigs in trailers and then uh, dropping them off on other people's property. Um, the natural spread of pigs is pretty low. Uh, um, they will be very centralized. They will be in one area. However, with fenced hunting, that grows, that increase. Um, and then, of course, released in the wild for hunting, that those populations absolutely explode. If you've ever seen Pig Bomb, I think it's a National Geographic or Discovery Channel, um, Dr. Jack uh, Mayer is the narrator for that, and he talks exactly about this release um, of wild pigs for hunting and the problem that it's having. Um, we talked about this distribution, and that is probably the biggest issue, is transportation. So we definitely want to stop transportation. Um, that's one thing I'm here to ask for your help with in increasing legislation to stop transportation. Uh, this was just something that B sent out this week about Alabama really being proactive. Anybody here from Alabama? All right. Actual, there's two steps to this. There's the actual catching people and then there's the prosecuting of, of somebody who's transporting uh -huh. illegally. In Mississippi, there is a punishment for illegal transportation of and release of wild hogs. Um, but it's pretty low. Some people find that it's worth it because there's not a lot of enforcement. Um, this is where we're trying to hit people in forfeiting their hunting privileges. That seems to be the bigger issue even than money. Um, and for legislators who say we don't want to tick off our hunters by uh, reducing hunting, most Mississippi residents actually do have a very negative attitude toward wild hogs, as you can see, almost half of them. We did This is a public <laughs> survey um, that we just completed. They also, on the bottom there, they agree and strongly agree to increase and enforce restrictions on interstate transportation of wild hogs. So that is good news. That, that helps us to know that we have public support for increasing those. Uh, just really quick, what we're doing, wild pinginfo.com, uh, Mississippi State University. We do a lot of um, outreach and education for wild hogs. We are in the process of purchasing some highway billboards to get the word out to the public that are actually on those roadways. We've been working with law enforcement officials so that they recognize hogs being transported. We have some other extension resources. Uh, we are participating in drone research, so we're actually using technology to find out where these uh, damaged spots are. That's a damage to a levee in rice, and the first one was corn. We are actually engaging youth in this so that um, they know from a very early age that wild pigs are bad. And we have an international wild pig conference uh, every other year to bring together people from all over the world who are dealing with this issue. Uh, and we just finished our public attitude research I was mentioning earlier, looking at a wild hog public attitude and knowledge. And we also um, asked landowners about their experiences. We still need help though. We need to spread the word about the negative impacts. We need to tighten up the legislation, uh, especially on transportation. And we need to gain support from hunters um, on this issue because they, there's a huge impact to the native wildlife. And I know I've gone way over, I'm sorry. I appreciate your time and I, I doubt I have any time for questions, but I will. Yeah, unfortunately we'll have 100 time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tiger.